If you're looking to scale your business and learn from the best life and health insurance agents in the industry, you're in the right place. This is your host, Jason Hoffman, and you're listening to the Agents on the Move podcast, where we profile producers who are consistently at the forefront of the industry in production and management expertise. Joining us from Elkhart, Indiana, Silas the Virus Jessup, the insurance industry's Aristotle, a big thinker and an infectious leader. This episode, you can learn how he has evolved over his 20 years in the business and the techniques he has used to scale his own agency and how he has helped other agents apply these practices to grow their careers. Silas, take us back to your first day in the field. Wow, yes, it's actually kind of seared in my mind. My first day in the insurance business was actually 9-11-01. So almost 19 years ago now, and obviously that was the day that the planes flew into the World Trade Center. And so that was my first day where I was headed out to meet my sales leader, uh, Steve Cabajola at the time, and planning to spend the day with him. And I was literally listening to what was happening in my drive over there on the radio. And I got to his office and asked him if he'd had any clue what was going on. And he'd been you know, working and had no idea. And so um, we actually left and he had some, some client meetings. We went out and met with uh, several different clients, but it was a very surreal day, obviously, with all this going on. We didn't really sell much insurance that day. It was more clustering around TVs and watching what was going on in the world and wondering where we were. So yeah, that was a, a date that was seared in my mind. I think another gentleman in our business, Mike Gutierrez, that got his start on that same day. And so it was kind of an interesting way to start. So why insurance? Like w- what led you to this industry? So I actually, when coming out of college, I worked as a sales manager for a technology consulting company for a couple of years. And very quickly, I was age 24, and I realized very quickly that as long as I worked for somebody else, they were always going to determine what I was worth by what they were willing to pay me. And I was working in an organization as the sales manager. I felt like I was driving a lot of growth for the bottom line of the organization, but my income just wasn't on the same trajectory. And so in the summer of 2001, I decided that I was going to move from Indianapolis, where I went to college at Butler University, up to northern Indiana, where my uh, wife today, girlfriend at the time, had had actually relocated to, and our family was from. And so I began to look for business opportunities. I think I might have been a little bit unique coming into this business in that I was truly looking for a business opportunity. I looked at some franchise opportunities. I looked at some independent distributor-type opportunities. And I got introduced to the insurance business by a gentleman by the name of Tom Sandlin. And, you know, looking at this business, I think there were some things that jumped out at me early that have proven to be very true throughout the course of my career. Number one, I thought there were very low barriers to entry. I just needed a laptop, an insurance license, and a cell phone to get started in the business. A lot of the other franchise opportunities I was looking at, you know, they were going to require some sort of a large upfront capital investment. I needed inventory and storefront and, and brick and mortar you know, with this business, I just didn't need any of those things. And so that was that was really attractive to me. And I think one of the big things that I looked at up front, I'd say the second thing was just the flexibility. I liked the idea of running a business on my schedule. And I wanted that flexibility. At age 24, I didn't have a family, I didn't have kids. But I did have an idea and a dream for what I wanted over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And part of that was the flexibility, you know, to, to coach and get involved with my kids as they grew up and things like that. And so that flexibility was important. I think the big thing that really drew me into this business was the idea of residual income. And that has proven itself out year after year after year. I tell new agents coming into this business, I do a decent amount of recruiting. And, you know, I've never had a year in this business that my income didn't increase by at least 20 grand year over year. And many years it's been much more significant than that. I look at my entire sales team today. I have about 60 advisors, you know, directly under my umbrella as a sales leader. And I do an income analysis for them every single year. In 2019, our agents, and and what I do is I pull out the agents who in their first 18 months, because I really feel like they're they're new agents in the business. Uh, But for the agents who had been with us for more than 18 months, my average agent made $132,000 in income in 2019. When you're looking at those kinds of averages year after year after year, I can look back over the last 19 years and say, you know, one of those things that drew me into the business really, really proved itself out in spades. So how far along into this business were you where you kind of realized, yeah, I can do this. I can make a successful career out of it. So it was very early. I mean, like my first week, I kind of began to realize the potential. I think the gentleman who brought me into the business did an excellent job of selling me the dream of what this could be and really planting that vision. Uh, very early in my career. 
I had big ideas and big aspirations for what I wanted to accomplish. And so my first appointment in the field, it was not a family member. It was actually a lead that came in that I booked an appointment and I made a pretty sizable sale to the point where the commissions I made off of that one sale paid for all of my expense to get started in the business. So my licensing, my laptop, like all of that was wiped out in my first sale. And I look back and I, you know, today we deal with a lot of self-employed small business owners and there's not many small businesses that get started and they're profitable in week one. You know, many of these it's months, if not years before they actually turn a profit. So I think I recognized the potential when I saw that. I also think the organization that I've been with for the last 19 years does a really good job of highlighting and spotlighting top producers. And I, I remember very early in my career, I think I was three months in, I started in September of 2001. And in December, I was able to attend the first annual meeting for the company. And just being able to see some of the people that were able to walk the stage and the successes that people were, were having, that made a big impact on me early in my career. And I distinctly remember thinking, if these people can knock it this far out of the park, I think I can do the same thing. And so that gave me a lot of hope very early in my career. Right. Once you get to know those people, it's like you start to think, well, I'm not all that different than they are. You know what I mean? Everybody has ups and downs. What would you say was your lowest point in this business or just in your adult career in general? Yeah, I, I think I've been very fortunate in that I have, I feel like I've modulated things well and I've had some, some high highs and some low lows, but the lows have never gotten too low. But when I think back over the last 19 years in the insurance business, probably the biggest low point that jumps out to me is when the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010. I think there was a lot of uncertainty I personally was concerned that I was going to be legislated out of business at that point. And that was really the only point in my career where I began to proactively look at what other business opportunities could I pivot into if this falls apart. And so that was, that was a time where, you know, I was nine years into the business and really questioning whether or not I'd made the right decision. Everything was very, very good at that point, but I, I felt like I saw the writing on the wall I felt like the government was getting way too involved in what we were trying to do in, in the market itself. Hindsight being 2020, though, I realized that that was probably one of the biggest opportunities that ever existed in our career. One of the things that I've constantly, and, and I think that that 2010 to 2015 timeframe really, really taught me as we've lived the implementation of the Affordable Care Act is that any time there's that kind of volatility, there's tremendous opportunity for the folks who jump in and engage and have the guidance and counsel to give. And so that's something that, you know, it was a big lesson for me, but it, that was probably the lowest point because I literally was out looking for my next business opportunity. And quite candidly, I didn't, wasn't looking at anything in a regulated insurance sector. And so I look back and I'm like, man, I, I did waste some time and effort and money and energy looking at other opportunities then. I wish I wouldn't have done that. But that was certainly a great lesson to learn as we kind of progressed through that and realized it was, it was much more of an opportunity than we ever expected. So what is one idea that you thought was going to be great and you tried to implement it and it did not work? And what did you do to kind of overcome that? Yeah, so we, you know, boy, I've had a lot of different great ideas that flopped very early. I've launched offices that didn't pan out. I've hired agents, you know, that didn't work out. I've lost clients. I mean, there's just a, a, a lot of different things that, uh, you know, I failed at over the years, but I've always believed, you know, that's, this business is based on being an entrepreneur and part of being an entrepreneur is figuring it out. I had a, a great conversation with my little brother a week ago and he's in a, not in the insurance business, but he's in a situation where he, he problem solves and troubleshoots. And, you know, I look at what we do day to day, whether it's as an agent or a leader in this business, and I think this is probably transcendent across all successful business owners is that they have the innate ability to problem solve and troubleshoot and just figure things out. And I feel like that's one of the things that really helped me a lot of different times when I, I stumbled or I fell down in my career is power through and figure it out. I even say that to my clients today. I tell them, you know, I've been in the business for almost 20 years. And while I know a lot, probably not the biggest value that I bring to the table. You know, the biggest value that I bring to the table is if there's something that needs figured out, I really think I can figure it out. And, and I find within my organization and my team, the agents who have that ability to just figure things out, you know, typically do find success. So every time I've stumbled, that's kind of helped me through. Fortunately, I can't say I've had a, you know, a catastrophic failure either. <laughs> I think part of that is, is that I, I'm a pretty deliberate person. I'm a pretty thoughtful person. I don't make big decisions haphazardly or quickly. And, and there maybe have been opportunities that I missed out on because I didn't make quicker decisions on things. Sometimes that haunts me a little bit. 
you know, different investments and I, maybe not so much in the business, but I, you know, investment opportunities where I've, I've drugged my feet a little bit and an opportunity passed me by. But also looking back over two decades in this business, I think it's probably served me well more than it's hurt me to be thoughtful and deliberate and do my due diligence before I make a big decision. And I, I think a lot of these failures, these times that I've, I've stumbled a little bit, that's certainly been reinforced in those types of situations. How about a good idea that really transform your business and help it take off? Yeah, so I think one of the things that I've really focused on my entire career is how to scale. How do I scale to the opportunity that's before me? I've always seen a big opportunity here. And so I'm constantly thinking behind the scenes, what can I do to grow? What can I do to scale? And you get to a certain point where it's not just man hours and and work on your own effort. You have to start thinking about how do I put a, a hierarchy? How do I put an infrastructure in place underneath what I'm building to continue to support it and allow it to grow. I had a a gentleman who was president and CEO of our business for, I think, nine years, Ken Fazola. He said something to me once, though, that really struck a chord. And this was back when I was running everything for myself. I did not have an assistant. I didn't have anybody really supporting me. I was an agent and a sales leader, so I was filling two roles. And he made a recommendation. He said, you know, Silas, you need to make a list of all the things that you that need to get done on a weekly basis, and then rank order them from the most important to the least important, and then draw a line where above that line, you're the only person that can do it, and then focus on those things and delegate everything else. And so I really went through that exercise. I think it's been maybe nine years ago when I hired my first assistant uh, to come into the business. Uh, I went through that process and really, and, and that's something I constantly look at every single year. And since then, I've hired, I think I have four assistants working in some capacity directly under my umbrella on the independent side where they work for me. And then I have two corporate sales assistants as well. And so I've tried to figure that out. How do you scale? And I think that Ken's comments and Ken's guidance a number of years ago really was instrumental in helping me make make that move. So what do you think has made you, you know, an effective leader over the last 20 years now that you have a, a team of agents? So I think I go back to servant leadership is a big piece of it. There's a quote that I've always appreciated. It was actually from Tom Landry. And it was, leadership is a matter of having people look at you and gain confidence, seeing how you react. If you're in control, they're in control. I think good leaders must first become good servants. You know, they must always be aware of and and, and kind of reading and thinking about how they're acting and reacting because people around them are looking to them for guidance and counsel. And so to me, you know, leading from the front is really important. That's one of the reasons why I've maintained the state in personal production for as long as I have is because I do believe that it gives me tremendous credibility with the agents and the, you know, the, the people that are a part of my organization and my team to see me really working hard to lead from the front and do the work that they do. I think leading from the front and then, and then that servant leadership and, and trying to figure out how can you help serve you know, the agents that are a part of the organization. Obviously, alongside that, you know, accountability, having standards. I mean, those are all things that maybe don't need to be said, but I think they do because they're important as a leader building out the culture of the organization. Culture means a lot. And, you know, I think a lot of times you can create a culture as a leader that people want to be a part of. And that's a a uniquely different way to attract and retain talent that is coming into the business is making sure that you got that good culture. So those are all things that I look at from a leadership perspective and things that I think are pretty important, you know, if someone is serving in a leadership role. So do you think it was a gradual kind of shift or evolution over time? Or did you have like maybe a breakthrough moment as a manager where you kind of had like the light bulb went off and you said, this is how I have to do it? Yeah, I, you know, I kind of joke about it with with agents today and and even new recruits that I'm bringing on board. I think when I started in the business, I, I was a horrible manager. I became a leader in this organization in title anyway, in like 2005. And, you know, I came into it with pretty high aspirations, big ideas, big thoughts. I knew what I wanted to do. And I just kind of made the assumption that everybody that I worked with wanted the same thing that I wanted. And I think one of the big pivot moments for me was to really come to that realization and understanding that not everybody wanted what I wanted. And I totally flipped up how I engaged with agents uh, several years into leadership. And I really came at it from the angle of what do you want from this business? Let me help you achieve what you want. And in doing that, I just found there was so much more camaraderie. Agents were so much more thankful for what I was doing for them. My focus was on what they wanted as opposed to get, trying to get them to do what I wanted. I mean, it seems so simple, but that was a big shift in my business, especially on the leadership side of things. I think you still got to be a driver. I'm still a type A personality. I still you know, like to push agents, but I'm pushing them to achieve what they want to achieve as opposed to pushing them towards goals that I've set for them. And that was a big deal 14, 15 years ago for me. 
Yeah, coming to the realization that not everybody's going to want what you want, I think is big just in general. So do you do you have a morning or daily routine that you like to start your day with? Yeah, I'm an early riser. I've trained myself over the years to get up early. There's actually, it's a video I play for my team pretty regularly. It's Robin Sharma. He's a you know motivational speaker online. He has a, a concept that he kind of teaches to and talks to. And there's some great videos on YouTube about the 5 a.m. club and just the idea of getting up early and getting rolling. You know, I do a lot of reading and I, I try to follow and mimic what successful people are doing. And you do any work in that particular arena, you realize that the most successful people, the one percenters, they get up early and they start crushing it early in the day. And so certainly I always have aspirations of getting up and, and exercising. That's one of those things that it's a constant battle, uh, making sure I do that. But I'm always up early. One of the things we have that we're fortunate here in Indiana, we have time changes. And one of the things that's a real blessing for me is coming into the fall and the fourth quarter, which is our crazy busy time when I've got to dedicate more hours, we actually are, are we have a time change. And so if I'm getting up at five o'clock a.m. right now, when that time change happens, I can get up at the exact same time, but it's actually 4 a.m. And so I, I build that in. I mean, that's a gift of seven hours a week when that time change shifts. And I don't really have to change my behavior or my pattern because, you know, that internal clock, I'm getting up at the exact same time. And so I think getting up early, you know, I've got a family today, three young children, and it's important for me, one of the things that I am focused on, one of my big goals is to spend time with them and carve out the, the personal time to spend with, you know, with my family. I'm doing the business to take care of my family. So I, I feel like I'd be really remiss if I didn't carve out time for them. And that typically is in the evening. So morning time to me, if I can get two, three, four hour jump start on most other people, you know, there's a sense of accomplishment that comes with that. I feel like I'm getting so much done before seven or eight o'clock in the morning. But then that also allows me to knock off a little bit earlier in the day. There's a lot of, you know, evenings. I mean, I coach football for my son. I don't miss dance recitals. I mean, those things get built into my schedule, but it's because I get up early. Same thing on weekends. And for me, it's just a, a habit. I get up early. So Saturday and Sunday mornings, I'm up very similar times. I may sleep in an extra 30 minutes or something, but my internal clock gets me up even if the alarm doesn't. And I find one of the beauties of how my career has developed is that my business is not only my business, it's also become one of my hobbies. And that's a dangerous thing on one hand because it, it makes that work-life balance tough. But I would also say, you know, when I get up on a Saturday or Sunday morning, I want to, I'm excited to go check numbers and, and review things and review what agents have done and, and look at where we're at for the week and really crunch the numbers on things. I really enjoy doing that work. So those are things that I do even on weekends, early in the morning. And then once the family gets up, I'll shut down work and, you know, jump into the day, you know, the weekend with them. So do you achieve that balance by scheduling it into your calendar? Yes. I live by my schedule. My schedule got so crazy. I, I mean, I have a full-time assistant, but that's what she does is manages my schedule. And I kind of joke about it with clients. I say, you know, if you need to get on my schedule, please call Christy. If you call me, I don't even know when, when my open spots are. And I ask them to please not be offended. And I kind of joke about the fact that my wife literally calls my assistant and puts stuff on the schedule when she needs me places and needs me to do things. But that's something that I think I was way too haphazard about early in my career was managing my schedule. And as you get busier and busier and busier and trying to be more effective and efficient in, in your day-to-day -day operations, it just becomes a necessity to live by the schedule. And honestly, once you get to that point, it seems like it's something that's going to be restrictive. But once you get to that point, it creates a lot more freedom, in my opinion. Um, because I know when I step away from the business, things are done. And I can actually enjoy my personal time and the time that I'm scheduling outside of the business a lot more because I know I was a real effective and efficient with the hours that I put in. Yeah, I noticed a huge shift when I gone away from to-do lists and putting it into my schedule because then it gets done. So what do you think has given you the most satisfaction or sense of accomplishment in your career? I think the biggest thing for me, and it's kind of interesting because early in my career, before I was in leadership, I really enjoyed helping people and making a sale. Like it was a rush. I mean, it was, it was an euphoric rush when I would walk out of a, a client's home or their business. And I was able to, you know, first educate them on what their options were, really understand their situation, present myself as a, the expert that I was trying to be at that point, and then get the deal, you know, get them to say, yeah, I believe you, I trust you. I want to do business with you and I'm going to take your recommendation. And then the, you know, the opportunity to earn the income off of that, that was an enormous rush. And I remember when I thought about getting into leadership, I, I was afraid that I was not going to be able to enjoy that rush as much. What I found though, as I got into leadership is that helping new agents get up and running and even having a bigger impact in that, I mean, you're impacting somebody's career by leading them in the right direction and, and getting them on a path where, you know, they're seeing 20, 30% increases in income year after year after year. To me now, 
that, that's a much bigger satisfaction to see new agents be successful and, and to see veteran agents just crush it year after year after year. I, I get tremendous satisfaction out of looking at that. It, it's fun. I've got such a great core group of agents around me and, you know, they're all doing really well. And it's not all about money. I don't think you can get too wrapped up in money. And I, I always say money's not everything, but money makes everything a lot easier. And it allows you to focus on the finer things in life, the things that people want to, being with your kids and being able to take vacations, even in the midst of this COVID. I mean, I, we took our family to Jackson Hole, Wyoming for a week over the 4th of July and just did some really cool things. We've taken several long weekends, you know, through the summer. Just having the, you know, the financial capability to be able to do those things and not be stressed out or worried about it. I think it's healthier for our family. I think it's healthier for my marriage with my wife. I just think a lot of cool things that come out of that. And so, you know, I really try not to be a, too focused on money. I don't want to be greedy, but I also have a, a very acute understanding that money does make things a lot easier. And I'm not going to accomplish the goals that I want to accomplish personally or professionally without the financial component being a huge piece of it. Yeah, I think there comes a point in time where you have enough money and then you have to ask yourself, do I still enjoy what I'm doing? Correct. And if the answer is no, then maybe you're not in the right career. That's exactly right. And we deal, I mean, I'm sure you do too, Jason, but we, we deal with you know people coming into this business who have had tremendous success in the past, but haven't found the fulfillment that they're looking for. And I hear that more and more from people that I'm talking to and recruiting is that I want to help people. I want to do something that has a, a, a bigger impact than just selling a widget or selling a product or machining something or whatever, whatever business past business they might've been in. And so that's one of the things I've, you know, I think I didn't necessarily recognize that up front as much as I do today, but there is tremendous satisfaction. Um, I think we're in a very noble profession. And I think when, when the good work that we do manifests itself by really helping a family out at the, the worst point in their life, there's tremendous satisfaction that I pull from that. So Silas, if you get one do-over in your business career, what would you have that be? I don't think that, like I said, when I look back, I don't have, I mean, I have places that I've stumbled and I've fallen. I just, I can't think of a catastrophic type of situation, but I, I always go back to that 2010 and I kind of beat myself up with about it a little bit that when the Affordable Care Act was passed, I didn't have a better line of sight or a better understanding of the, the positive impact that that was going to bring to the table for us. I went very negative on that. And, and really felt like, like I said earlier, that my business, I might be legislated out of business. And so at that point, I mean, there was probably a 12 to 18 month time frame there where I exerted effort, money, energy in pursuing other business opportunities. It's always an interesting thing. I've talked to a lot of successful business people, and I think there's different schools of thought. Uh, I had a long conversation with a local person in my area here several years ago. And, you know, this person was maintaining that the, the best way to be successful in business is to have multiple streams of income and be diversified and all these different types of things. I guess I've kind of gone to the other end of the spectrum where I feel like to be successful in, in business, I want to be an expert at something, be in a little bit of a niche and focus all my effort, energy and money and investment into that particular thing. And that's my, you know, that's my insurance business, my insurance practice, my agency. And so I've found that I feel like I've achieved more success by being very focused on one thing, as opposed to trying to distribute my effort and energy across multiple things. And I look back in 2010, you know, I was torn. I was torn in two different directions. And I feel like maybe I, I could have been in a little different place a little quicker if I hadn't diverted those resources and energies down trying to pursue another career, another path, looking at what other opportunities might be out there. So if I had looked back and say, what could I hit reset on and not do? That was probably the biggest thing that jumped out at me. So what are some of the good choices you think you've made that have kind of made you who you are? I mean, some of the basics, hard work, obviously, I, I put in a lot of hours. I think that I mentor a lot of people coming into this business and part-time effort yields part-time results. So, you know, hard work is one of the things that is consistent across the board for, you know, people who, who are successful. I think that that ability to scale, that's one thing that I'm constantly thinking about and constantly working on is how do I scale and how do I delegate? Those are two things I've struggled with my entire career, not necessarily the scaling, but how do you do it? How do you do it well? I don't want to get out over my skis. I don't want to be unable to deliver on promises that I've made to myself or my agents or my family or my clients. So I want to, I want to grow intentionally. I don't want to grow with the right infrastructure. So that's one thing. But to grow, it requires delegating. It requires taking tasks and passing them off to somebody else. And that's something I've always struggled with. I'm unfortunately the kind of person who at times believe is if it's going to be done right, I'm the guy who has to do it. And so I struggle with putting too much on my own plate. I struggle with not saying no. I struggle with not releasing control. 
of you know certain processes and systems. And that's something that I am constantly, constantly working on because part of being successful in any business, I think, is figuring out how to grow, surrounding yourself with good people, and then trusting that those people are going to do it. Unfortunately, you know, whether it's in my personal life or my business life, I'm, I tend to be a pretty critical person. I tend to be critical of myself. I tend to be critical of people around me. And I'm sure that there are people around me who suffer at some level because of, you know, I have high standards for, for what I want to accomplish. So balancing all that and trying to keep that work-life balance, you know, those are some of the biggest things that I have struggled with, but you figure it out. You know, that's part of, that's part of being a, a successful business owner is, is again, figuring things out like that. Yeah, it's it's hard if you're a perfectionist to be able to let go of certain things and then also to try and, you know, require from other people what you kind of expect from yourself is is hard to put those expectations on people when they're not wired the same way. It is. And I've had I mean, I've been engaged in a decent amount of conflict over the years specifically on that point. I guess I've always believed in and I've proven to myself too that being very genuine, very transparent and just communicating at a very high level eliminates a lot of those problems. You know, that's the one thing that I think we've been able to avoid or mitigate a lot of conflict over the years, just because I am willing to sit down and have those tough conversations. I don't shy away from that. I, if something needs to be addressed, we try to address it. I try to address it and hit it head on. And I, I think ultimately, whoever it is that you're serving or working with or or living with, they, they come to appreciate the fact that you are transparent and, and you're laying things out on the table and trying to be genuine and real uh, about where, where you're at, what you're feeling, and maybe even what next steps might be. So you have four to six people that help you out. I mean, what are some of the ways that you guys all stay on the same page? Do you have a weekly or biweekly meeting where you kind of review everything that everybody's doing? Yes, I have several meetings that we set up that are weekly, you know, with different groups of kind of my leadership team. So I have support staff and then I have even agents within my team that help field training, things like that. So I have a field training weekly meeting. We have a leadership weekly meeting where we go over things. So, you know, we work to keep everybody on the same page. I do... I do host pretty regular. I, I host an agent development training every week for all of the agents, you know, in our, our territory. And I invite our support staff to jump on that too. That's one thing I've always kind of battled with is do assistants and support staff need to be involved in the training and sales function of the business. And I, I guess I've landed on the side that I think they do. I think they need to understand the business. They need to understand what we're trying to accomplish. They need to understand the numbers. I want them to be a part of things. And so, you know, we, tr we try to loop those, those assistants and, and support staff in as, as often as we can. But, you know, I, technology is the other big thing that we do use. Our internal CRM system provides a, a lot of opportunity for us to document things, schedule things, do things, and we don't have to have a conversation about it. They, they put things on my schedule and I put things on their schedule through that system. And so that is, that's been really helpful in, in kind of coordinating everything, bringing everything together. It was interesting because uh, about two years ago, I, my main assistant, she was actually working remotely for me. And I got to a point where I said, I just need you next to me more or at least some hours during the week. And so we moved, worked into an office together. So I have uh, my main office manager and my, my main assistant who work you know, next to me in an office. Interestingly enough, though, with COVID, we really pushed remote and we did. You know, I, I certainly didn't want to create any sort of adverse situation for employees and things. And so I, I really gave them the choice of, you want to work here? And so we went virtual. We've been virtual now for quite a while. I'm starting to ease back into being at the office a little bit more. But it is amazing how well things are working in a virtual setting. And I think with technology, with technology like Zoom and, and you know some of the different screen sharing and, and video conferencing, a lot can be accomplished. You just have to be intentional about it. So what's one thing that few people know about you? So on the personal side, I don't know how many people might know that I, I actually live in a very rural Amish community. <laughs> we, uh, my family and I live on a, a little lake in Northern Indiana, but it's in Middlebury, Indiana which is a, a very large um, concentration of, of, of Amish people. The road that runs south out of our lake, it's Amish families and Amish community to the point where they don't even have electricity that actually runs down that road because they don't use electricity. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Sometimes it is interesting when I'm with other agents and leaders and things, especially people who you know are operating in a much larger metropolitan area. You know, We don't have a lot of luxuries. The sushi, if I want sushi, I've got to drive. 30 to 40 minutes to find some place that I can actually buy sushi, you know, not a lot of traffic, not a lot of traffic, but it's actually been a, a great place. And, you know, part of my strategy from the beginning was I wanted to create a certain type of environment for my family and my kids to grow up in. And I think this is a, a good, you know, we're in a good school district. The kids live on a lake. They get to spend the summer on the lake. It, the cost of living here is insanely low compared to where it was a lot of other places in the country. So 
you know, we're able to have things and do things because of, you know, where we live. So that might be something that's a little different. The only other thing on the personal side is, is I'm an avid duck hunter. So that's kind of a weird sport. I grew up, my father was a, a duck hunter. And so I grew up with it as a kid. And it's just a passion I've always had. And I've roped a bunch of my buddies into uh, getting engaged in it as well. So unfortunately, duck hunting season actually runs during the fourth quarter of the year, which is our crazy busy time. So I'm not able to carve out as much time as I'd like for it, but it's definitely a passion that I have and something that on the personal side gets my juices flowing. Awesome. So if you, if you could leave us with one thing that you draw inspiration from, whether that's, you know, a book, a podcast, anything you would recommend to other people. Yeah. So I, I am a pretty avid reader. I also enjoy, I mean, it's so, there's so much content for consumption out there when it comes to YouTube, you know, whether it's Simon Sinek or Jay Shetty, Eric Thomas, the hip hop preacher, Tony Robbins, you know, I enjoy the content that they put out. When I'm working out, one thing I enjoy is just going through, going into YouTube motivation and finding there's some really cool stuff. And I've actually compiled some of those, you know, for my team. I pushed one out this morning to our team. It was called uh, Life of an Entrepreneur. It's like a minute and a half snippet. It's out on YouTube. And it's, I, I think it uh, tells a wonderful story about that to me seems very personal to the business that I've been in. And it kind of follows that path. Um, I'll tell you though, recently, one of the things that I've been engaged in that a lot of local organizations here. So I live in Northern Indiana, I'm in Elkhart County. And we're actually in the RV capital of the world. A lot of people may not know that. We manufacture RVs here by the thousands, tens of thousands, and, and then they get distributed all over the country. And so it's heavy manufacturing. So, you know, there's a lot of people making a ton of money. The RV industry is just exploded here uh, with COVID happening. And so a lot of the local organizations, and I guess I don't know if this is a worldwide thing, or but a lot of local organizations here have gotten involved in this kind of a system, but it's, it's called EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System. And um, a gentleman by the name of Gino Wickman is the one who kind of came up with this. And it's, it's a whole program. They're EOS implementers that can actually, companies are paying tens of thousands of dollars to come in and help them just organize their business and structure their business and get the, the, the right tasks on the right person's plate get the right people in the right positions within the organization. And so I've been watching this and, and reading a lot about it kind of from the sidelines. I hadn't really engaged in it. And one of my, my good friends and actually the owner of a, a local insurance, a, a large group insurance agency here, he actually sent me a book and I just finished it this last weekend. And it was actually written by this Gina Wickman and it was called Rocket Fuel. And it's an interesting read because it really is breaking down uh, the difference between a visionary and an integrator within an organization. And the whole idea behind it is that, you know, literally you can create rocket fuel if you can get two people working together. I feel like I've always had more visionary tendencies. I have big ideas, I have big thoughts. Sometimes I get, things get lost in the weeds for me though. And so this is just a new concept. I'm contemplating and thinking and my mind's been spinning for about two weeks here that I've been reading this. I finished it this weekend, took a lot of notes on it and just trying to figure out, and, and this kind of goes back to my desire to scale my practice and to scale our organization. How do I do that effectively? And I'm beginning to realize as time goes on, I need more good people to support me. And to me, I'm kind of beginning down this path of following this EOS system and understanding what does it look like if I can find somebody who's an integrator, somebody who can take an idea that I have and, and run with it, and that I can trust them to do that. I think that's that could be a very dynamic relationship if you can find somebody who can fill those shoes and, and really do it well. That's kind of the, maybe the next step for me. I don't know. I'm, I've, I've got a lot of things spinning, a lot of notes I'm taking on what that might look like to integrate or to bring an integrator into my business and just help help with coordinating things across the agency. One of the things I've realized is the less I do in my business, the better it is for everybody, for me, for them, for my family, you know, for the bottom line. That's a hard pill to swallow though, you know, and you know how it is. You did the same as I have that you built it from scratch and, and had tremendous success and ended up where you're at today. But that's, that's one of the, the biggest battles I have. And one of the things that I'm focusing on is how can I, how can I pull myself more and more out of day-to-day -day operations, kind of making sure that I'm focusing on the things that I need to be focusing on, which probably are the bigger picture type items. Unfortunately though, when you're self-employed, when you're an entrepreneur, you know, you get drugged into the weeds daily on things. And so I, I'm, I'm still figuring all that out. But this book called Rocket Fuel has actually given me some great ideas and some great context around, you know, what next steps might look like and the kind of person that I need and, you know, what kind of income I need to be paying somebody in that type of a role. So it's been, it's been a, a really interesting progression over the last couple of weeks. Awesome. So with a last name like Jessup, you have to have a nickname. <laughs> well, a first name like Silas, it's kind of a weird name to begin with, you know. 
I've always said, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I've ever really had a, a, a nickname. So like Colonel Jessup, a few good men. I, I've had people reference that, you know, Silas Martyr was a, a name that a lot of people knew. It's always been interesting because I, I have had um, people butcher my name pretty significantly too, especially Silas. But, you know, looking back, I guess in the beginning, I thought, hey, is this a deterrent for people, you know, really engaging with people? And what I found is that having a unique name, I think, has served me well. Once people get it, then they remember you, right? That, that's something that I think has been helpful and beneficial. But yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of Jasons. There's not a lot of Silas's. Any kind nicknames that I've ever had over the years, you know, that Silas. Um, I know my parents have called me Cy forever. So, you know, that's Cy or Silas is, is, is how most people address me so <laughs> awesome well silas man thanks so much for coming on and sharing your thoughts your story what makes you a great leader uh, we appreciate it buddy yeah absolutely jason why well, i, I want to give you kudos um i think what you're doing here uh, with your podcast and some of the the people the content that you're bringing to the table i think it's really well done i've listened to what you've done so far and quite candidly i was honored to be asked to, to join you today so um, i appreciate you taking the time i think a lot of people are going to benefit from the good work you're doing so well done we appreciate that man thanks bud Everyone, thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Agents on the Move podcast. You can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to your podcast. If you thought the content was beneficial to you, please subscribe to the show, write a review if you'd like. We look forward to joining you again. Thanks.